Yeah, I'm Brendan from Google. Um, I'm working on address space isolation, which is... Um, that's you. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> um, I, um, well, I'm one of many, really, and the, there's been a, a sequence of us. Um, I, address space isolation is kind of like an attempt to take back the strategic initiative on CPU bugs. Um, I, I presented at LSF MMBPF uh, six months ago, and I spent almost the whole session explaining different details of how, how the implementation works. I'd quite like to skip over that today. Um, so I, I propose to spend five minutes rushing through an overview and go from there. Is that okay with everyone? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so here's a simplified view of some exploits. Um, the attacker, which is, let's say, guest or user space, sets up microarchitectural state very cleverly, branches into the victim domain, which is the, the host or the kernel. The kernel misspeculates, accesses some secret. The CPU detects the misspeculation and starts rolling back the instruction, but leaves some residue behind in the microarchitecture. Uh, and then the attacker leaks that residue out. Um, the classic example of the residue is like um, cache entries uh, that were loaded from a location that depended on some secret value. And then you can infer from which the timing of which of the memory accesses which cache entries are there, and from there you can infer some bits of the secret. Um, so there are three places on this picture where we can intervene. Um, the two straightforward ones are on the transition between security domains, so like temporarily. Uh, and the other thing is that you can't speculate, you can't speculatively access data if it's not in the TLP, it's not mapped. Because um, of, yeah. We hope that that's true, at least. <laughs> We're pretty sure it's true. Um, oh, my slides were in the wrong order. So, um, with those three things in mind, um, let's try and design a blanket mitigation for everything. So, if you run your untrusted code without anything secret mapped, which probably you do anyway, um, and then after you run the untrusted code, you destroy your branch predictor. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but you'd also like to turn off hyperthreading at that point. Um, and then before you go back into our untrusted code, if you destroy like your whole cache and your uh, like load and store buffers and your TLB or something, then all of this stuff goes away. Uh, obviously, all of those things that I talked about destroying are important, and we want them. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So we don't want to do all of those things, but, but it's a good starting point to like illustrate that if you could do that and you could destroy enough things on transitions, then the problems do, would go away. Um, so ASI is kind of about making those domain transitions less frequent by going into the kernel and executing kernel stuff um, without secrets mapped. Um, and we don't want to make the whole kernel aware of that, that it has to like switch address spaces when it wants to access certain data. So we want to make that, tran uh, that transparent. So we keep all, as much kernel code as possible unaware of it, and we detect it by having a page fault. In the page fault, we destroy some microarchitectural state that we don't trust. And then if we did that transition, then on the way back into the VM or way back into user space, we do another flush, whatever that might be. Um, so um, that's the idea. <laughs> um, and here's some evidence that it works. I guess you can't see this, but um, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So the top three uh, lines, uh, this one here, can you see the point? I'm, yeah. yeah. Um, that's like if you have mitigations off, you, you trust your workloads. This is a throughput benchmark. It's a QEMU guest running on a Zen 2 host. I thought it, I, I rented a VM. Uh, uh, sorry, I rented a, a server from Hetzner, and I was like, cool, the model number starts with three, so this is a Zen 3 machine. Um, but n model numbers that start with three are Zen 2. <laughs> so this is Zen 2. Um, uh, so there's your performance with mitigations off. Um, we, like I said, we have some mitigations that are like pretty blanket that exist in the kernel today, and they probably mitigate loads of stuff we don't know about. Um, so for example, this one is if you do an IBPB every time you leave a VM. Um, even just that alone just completely tanks performance, so this is like more than a 50% degradation. And then we have bespoke mitigations, which I guess like you guys have to like frantically develop every time a new mitigation comes out. So here is, um, which one is this? I forget which one it is. Um, yeah, so this is uh, not safe ret, but the one before safe ret. Anyway, so we have some mitigations that are really generic and really costly, and we have some mitigations that are really fast, um, but they are costly to develop. Uh, I'll skip over this middle graph. Um, well, actually, no, I won't. So that top one there is my RFC. 
So this is like a, the stupidest possible implementation of ASO. And it's already quite a bit faster than doing an IBPB on every VM exit. I don't know what the VM exits are there that we don't do an IBPB on, but it's some of them. And that's already nice. Um, and then down here is my R RFC plus a bunch of hacks to make it faster and, um, and do transitions less often. Um, and I hope that those hacks are like also viable, not as hacks. Um, so what we have here is like instead of we have the performance attributes of the bespoke mitigation, which is costly to develop, but something akin to the security properties of the generic mitigation, which works for everything. And that's the big idea. Um, any questions at this point? Yes. Um, if I'm reading this graph right, you're saying that you're saying that your RFC is faster than the baseline? Uh, the baseline of doing an IBPB on every VM exit, which is not a very realistic baseline. No one would, yeah. Uh, sorry, so this, okay. yeah, this, uh, is, this is the baseline. I, I, it, it's hard to read your slide because it's, 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 really, it, it's really small, but. You're sat too far away. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like I'm sitting in the front row. I'm, I'm too far away. <laughs> uh, what is the lowest line on your 610 baseline graph? So this here? The, no, the, the lowest one. Vulnerable. The furthest down. Oh, oh, the furthest one is when you're vulnerable, yeah. The mitigation is exactly, Right. Yeah. Your, 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 your um, <laughs> bottom slide is actually faster than that. Uh, that'll be noise if that's the case. So th these aren't confidence intervals. These are quartiles. So um, it's not faster. <laughs> that's that's um, a statistical artifact. Uh, but I, can't, I can't actually see the bottom one of my thing. There's like a UI element ho uh, hiding it. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's not real. <laughs> all right. So, so with your with your ASI, are you disabling all of the mitigations because once you do the ASI exit, then you're considered safe for this performance data? Yeah. Um, so this this is like the only mitigation that's enabled here is the rep lead one. Uh, yeah. So for the, like, that's not realistic, but that shows you the relative cost. The only mitigation that's enabled in the restricted address space or the full address oh, so, space? Oh, no, so when ASI is on it's in this data, it's the only mitigation enabled. And it's only mitigating st stuff like rep lead. So it's doing an IBPB on the address space transition. So it's a C reference weight and an IBPB. Like Peter? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh, actually, it would. So, if I was to run this, I th I'm pretty sure if I remember in the RFC, the example I had was like it would do that on AMD, and then on Intel, it would flush out one D on the inverse transition, um, which is not. We obviously need to do more than that, but it just. And you verified that the reproducers actually do not leak with ASI. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so oh, that's the, something I'll, I brag about in my next slide. Is so uh, we, some people from Google have taken exploits for a couple of. Uh, a couple of these exploits and turn them into self-tests. And so, yeah, um, my branch actually on GitHub has the one for L1TF in it. Um, so if you want to have a look. Um, and I've also bullied the security engineers into adding comments. So the one is like, OX414 NOPS. I've been like, you have to say why there are OX414 NOPS. <laughs> send, send patches, please. Uh, yeah, 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 we, we will do. Sorry for the delays. <laughs> have you considered? Um, using um, peak, uh, uh, protection keys to, uh, to speed this up? Yeah, yeah, um, I'd like to do that. Um, the, uh, I think the only benefit of that is that we don't then have to flush the TLB when we're changing what's in the restricted address space or not. So the cost of this isn't changing CR3. The cost of this is like doing IBPBs and stuff. Um, but I still think there is a benefit to that. We haven't like really researched it just because we have CPUs we care about that don't have that. Um, but eventually I think it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, oh, go ahead. So, have you thought about a way to uh, sort of separate the functions that run in the restricted address space versus the other ones so that mitigations can be applied to one or the other? Or how are you doing that? What do you mean by functions? Like, like so you exit the VM yeah. and you run in your little bubble, right, which is some KVM code. Yeah. Right. And then that might call some functions that, let's say, those functions require rep lead mitigation. But once you exit ASI, then 
functions that are called there don't require ASI or Repli mitigation, mm. right? So that that was covered in um, quite deep in the cover letter. The 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 way Paul Turner wanted to do this originally was to say that you you start like that and then you use profiling to find out which function is constantly wanting data that's not mapped by default, um, and then because in. In the in the in the fast path in KVM, there's there's no mitigation. You let speculation go wild, on the assumption that there's nothing secret to leak. Um, you take the page fault when you start accessing data that is not deemed safe yeah, for rogue speculation. Yeah, different than what I'm asking about. Though. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm asking like in the protected space, how do you prevent the code from calling like I don't know K malloc or something that does that does not have Repli protection? Well, we don't, it just, it can do that, but there's nothing for it to leak, so we don't care. I, may, I, may, I might be misunderstanding the question. Oh, oh okay, uh, maybe I... No, so, so the, 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 the difference is that you do a huge amount of scrubbing in the page for handler when you first move into the... Okay, so yeah, so you don't need to protect anything. It's yeah. Okay. Uh, who, who wanted it? The idea is you fault. So anything that can get at secret stuff, you fault. And then on the fault, that gives you the synchronous point to say, hey, I need to do all this flushing. And then you go in and you do your fancy secrety stuff. And you go back. Yeah. And this means that, so when I, in, the, in the past, when I described this to people, they were like, what? So now, every time I have kernel code that touches data, <laughs> like kernel code, basically, I have to think about whether I need to switch address spaces. And uh, so you don't, because the fault does it for you. And I think that's a good segue into the part that you really want to get to, which is how the hell do we actually upstream this? Yeah, yeah, so let's go from there. Um, so I posted the RFC like three months ago, and um, somebody pointed out that I missed out a new line, um, but nobody pointed out that I broke the, like, any freeing any kernel memory, so I don't think it got I don't think it got reviewed very carefully. Um, so I'm kind of here to be like I almost want to like get the code up and like let's read it together. Um, but like, what should should I carry on and turn this into a patch and and go ahead and and go for a review from there, or or what's the most important thing for us to discuss? Um, or if I I'll, otherwise, I'll just start proposing topics from the slides. It does look very interesting. I mean it. It, it can solve so many problems. It looks really interesting. I guess the, I'm, I'm just worried we're gonna get deep into it and then realize that there's a hole or there is some kind of performance issue that, that is a non-starter. Part that scares me and I think we really need to figure out is how do we maintain this once it lands. So profiling everyone's kernel that wants to build and what's their hotspots is not realistic. It may be realistic for Google, but it's not gonna be realistic for upstream. That's the part that I think we need to figure out from an how do we get this upstream in a maintainable way, not how do we get it upstream the first time? So that probably comes down to the, yeah. So, well, okay, first of all, I'd acknowledge that I think one of the biggest weaknesses is that it can have unpredictable performance um, in the sense that, like, my fear is that we have some, like, very hot path that doesn't currently cause an ASI exit, and then somebody loads a BPF program there, and it does now, um, which is, yeah, that's a concern, so you don't. Um, but yeah, I think the thing you're really getting at is that we have to decide what's sensitive and what isn't, and that's arguably different for different people, um, and um, it has a big impact on performance. Part, part of the problem there is that it's not even that it's, uh, the, that it's a yes, no choice. It, it's the same piece of information might be sensitive to some people and not sensitive to other, um, yeah. and, and you, you can't really deal with that in a single build of the kernel unless, you, um, unless you're having classifications of where do you allocate it. Yeah. Um, realistically, if you, if you make this a completely stable ABI and, and have one single threat model for everyone, don't you arrive at PKVM? Um, more or less? Like you, you're effectively creating a new address space, in this case like more like a tiny visor, whatever you call these things. Yeah, and well, the, that can then secret hide individual VM contexts, which yeah. is the one you really care about, right? So and you I, just consider I/O to be unsafe. Yeah. The, the two strategic differences from PKVM are one that this doesn't only protect us or sandbox KVM guests, and two, it like it's something that you just kind of like spread on the kernel without needing to like rearchitect your system. So that's, but yeah, the. But I think the also point answer is yes. <laughs> Running the problem like PKVM doesn't have RCU support yet. Just, just a minor wrinkle. Like, I don't think we can go straight to full PKVM and still have all the functionality that we want in KVM. And performance. 
Um, just hoist your stuff into PKVM into a low visor isn't a realistic option. Not in the next, because we don't want this four years from now for x86. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> the, the other one I, I had is um, there are basically two fundamental, or well, three now with PKVM, three two fundamental approaches, right? The other alternative to what you're describing is all of the secret hiding logic. Um, that we've been doing with uh, process local memory, now MM local memory, um, guest MFS to hide uh, memory from, from the direct map, so that anything that runs in the kernel is considered untrusted, always, right? right. What, what do you think about that concept instead? So th there was, like, like, I guess the closest thing to that is um, um, my, Mr. Roy, I keep forgetting his first name, Patrick Roy, presented um, uh, on unmapping guest memory from the direct map using KSMEMFD, and my, I, I want that too, um, but uh, because, well, that for two reasons it works nicely with ASI, um, because one, it like makes ASI more predictable, uh, and two, it, um, it also works against software bugs, which I guess is less important, but the, I still want ASI on top of that because ASI lets you protect, so their, their, their strategy I think there, which is not an unreasonable one, is let's unmap guest memory, then let's go and unmap vCPU uh, data, and then let's go right. and unmap this and that and this and that. Um, and ASI, you still have to go through that, that process, um, but uh, you don't have to re-architect KVM every time you do it, you just have to like find the place where your data is allocated and add the flag to say this data needs to be protected by ASI. And you can do that for user space too. Um, so I want both of those things, basically, if that makes sense. But they will converge eventually, right? Like, if, if you find all these places, you did re-architect, you no longer leverage the slow path of ASI. Uh, if you, potentially, yeah, but I think there's always going to be some data that, like, we don't know if it depends on some guest register state. Um, and, yeah, I know also, like, I keep going back to the thing that we also want to protect against uh, user space threads. And isn't the hard to maintain and scary part tagging stuff, not the actual mechanics? So I think we should not focus on, is it ASI or are we on mapping? It's how do we tag stuff? How do we maintain it and support multiple yeah. threat models? So uh, can I start the discussion off here by, by, so there are two like obvious ways to go here and, and neither of them is pleasant. And one is that we say, we assume every, so what we call an allow list model where we assume everything is sensitive and then we like bit by bit we figure out what we can afford, what we can, how we can speed things up. And the other is the deny list model where we start with like something that isn't kind of not theoretically secure and then we, we slow it down bit by bit. Um, and uh, the discussion at LSFM and BPF, somewhat surprisingly to me, lent towards the deny list model um, because that lets us have something in the kernel quite soon that people can actually run. Um, and we can go from there. And I don't want to stay with a world where we carry on having to like find things, but I think we could potentially evolve towards some hybrid where we're like we can wipe out broad classes of data all at once. Yeah, I, I think we will never come to a conclusion what the best set is until we really start with the basic set and work from there. Anything else is over engineering and uh, falls under the category perfect is the enemy of good. Right. So uh, I w what I really want to see is the basic infrastructure in deer and then we can take it from deer. And is the when you say the basic set, do you mean the most secure set or the most performance set? <laughs> no, the, 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 the mechanisms which okay, allow us to, to isolate. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then we apply it step by step to certain areas, figure out what is the problem, what mm. is the performance the performance hit was and figure it out uh, gradually instead of trying to to fit something into it we we never can agree on right yeah so, so on that point where do we go from here what do i do, do next <laughs> yeah so you mentioned guest a lot and does this only apply to kvm or will it also replace pti uh, so we uh, well, replacing PTI is a complex loaded co topic, but it definitely, we really want it to sandbox bare metal threads as well, yeah. And it's implemented as a framework that lets you do that, but we've only got the KVM client of that API so far, um, yeah. Cool, and cool, thank you. Um, so we got another break coming up. If you want to keep talking about it, feel free to come up and continue. Half an hour break. Thanks.